This is the final chapter of the course entitled Introduction to Emulsions and Foams. Emulsions and foams share many characteristics, but they're different enough to merit separate lectures. These colloids are of immense commercial interest. Most are hydrophobic colloids, consisting of combined emissible phases with their generation facilitated with additives which promote particle formation and stabilization. With stability, kinetic stability, being central to such systems, much of our discussion will focus on stabilizing and destabilizing these colloids. In this lecture, a general overview of the different types types of emulsions and their essential characteristics are reviewed, along with types of additives and techniques used in their generation and common destabilization pathways. Typical emulsions are biphasic systems consisting of liquid particles dispersed throughout a liquid medium. The particle phase is often referred to as the dispersed or discontinuous phase, while the solution phase that surrounds the particles is often called the dispersion medium or continuous phase. The optical appearance of emulsions varies due to differences in particle size, ranging from being optically clear for emulsions possessing nanoscale size particles to completely opaque for those containing particles in the micron size range. One approach for categorizing emulsions is based on particle size. Macro emulsions have the largest particles ranging in radius from 100 nanometers up to 10 microns and larger, which provides for their white, opaque, milk-like appearance. Macro emulsions are kinetically stable colloids, and they're typically what we we think of when discussing emulsions, which is why they're sometimes referred to as ordinary emulsions. Mini emulsions, often considered a subset of macro emulsions, possess particle sizes ranging in radius from 100 nanometers up to 1 micron. Such emulsions are translucent, possessing a blue-gray hue. Nano emulsions are kinetically stable colloids possessing particle radii ranging from about 10 up to 100 nanometers. Such colloids are optically clear. Although it may appear counterintuitive, emulsions possessing the smallest particles ranging from about 5 to 50 nanometers are called microemulsions. Such systems are optically clear. Although their particle size range overlaps with that for nanoemulsions, microemulsions compose a separate and quite interesting and quite complex category of colloids in that they are thermodynamically stable and sometimes described as swollen micelles. Our focus for this lecture will be on the most common type of emulsion, the macroemulsion. Familiar examples of macroemulsions include milk, butter, margarine, mayonnaise, and skin creams. In most cases, the primary components of such systems are oil and water which produces either an oil and water emulsion, O slash W, where the oil makes up the particles and water is a continuous phase, or a water and oil emulsion, W slash O, involving the opposite combination. These two types of emulsions do not exist in equilibrium with each other. One type will be inherently more stable than the other and will form in lieu of the less stable system. However, one type of emulsion can be converted to the other type by changing system conditions in a process known as inversion, which will be discussed later on. There are several characteristics that allow us to distinguish oil and water macroemulsions from the water and oil type, such as an oil and water emulsion has a creamy texture, while a water and oil emulsion has a more greasy feel. An emulsion can be readily diluted by its continuous phase, but not so much by its particle phase. This is easily tested with dilute emulsions. The electrical conductivity of oil and water emulsions is similar to that of water and is significantly greater than that for a water and oil emulsion. Oil and water emulsions are strongly colored by water-soluble dyes, while water and oil emulsions will only show the color faintly, but can be colored by oil-soluble dyes. If the two phases have different refractive indices, Focusing light up through the emulsion should distinguish the particles, which will appear brighter if they have a greater index of refraction than the continuous phase and darker if the refractive index is smaller. Finally, the contact angle will be very different for the two different types of emulsions. If placed on a low energy surface, the oil and water emulsion should produce a high contact angle, while the water and oil emulsion will produce a small contact angle or completely wet the surface. The opposite will occur with high energy surfaces such as glass. The primary components of a macroemulsion are water and oil. Usually the oil is less dense than water, and when we think of oil, we typically think of a viscous, greasy, nonpolar liquid which is insoluble in water. This comes from our experience with motor oil, vegetable oils, and so on. The only restriction we place on the oil here is that it be a liquid under ambient conditions that possess a low to moderate water solubility. Before discussing the aqueous phase, it is important to note that both the oil and water will have a certain amount of miscibility in each other, which can modify 
other properties. Now for the aqueous phase, factors such as ionic strength, pH, and the presence of dissolved organic species can impact the performance of the emulsifier and the stability of the form colloid. Emulsifier describes an additive or a mixture of additives that helps generate and stabilize an emulsion. A stable emulsion cannot be formed without an emulsifier. The key components of an emulsifier are surfactants, which reduce interfacial energy to aid in particle generation and can provide electrostatic and steric repulsion between particles. Most emulsifiers are a mixture of components, which in addition to surfactant species can contain amphiphilic polymers, solid particles, and even oligomers. These components contribute to repulsive interactions and help reinforce the interface to inhibit coalescence between particles. When oil, water, and emulsifier are used to generate the emulsion, the type of emulsion produced depends on the properties of the oil and water phases, including their volume fractions, and on the temperature and generation process used. However, the key factor is the type and amount of emulsifier applied. Although the science on this is limited, there are some general guidelines which help us with our selection. Industrially produced emulsions are typically generated via high energy mechanical means such as shaking, stirring, fluid shear, sonication, membrane metering, and others. Some examples of the equipment used to generate emulsions are shown here. In the laboratory, emulsions are commonly prepared using a sonicator probe for which energy input can be controlled for the generation of colloids from a wide variety of materials. In general, high energy approaches impart energy into the combined phases to produce interfacial area. The minimum energy required to generate an emulsion from oil, water, and an emulsifier is roughly proportional to the interfacial area produced. The change in interfacial area compared with the separated phases is quite substantial, and generation of smaller particles requires greater energy input. From a commercial feasibility standpoint, energy costs can be too high. Emulsions can also be generated using low energy, lower cost techniques, which involve changing conditions for an initial system composed of the oil, water, and emulsifier. An example of this is the exploitation of the phase inversion temperature, or PIT, usually involving emulsions stabilized via polyethoxylated non-ionic surfactants. Other changes, such as changes in ionic strength and component ratios, known in general as emulsion aversion point or EIP approaches have also been demonstrated. The type of emulsion formed, oil and water versus water and oil, is dependent on a number of things. Surprisingly, the ratio of the phase volumes is not a major factor since it is quite common to find emulsions with over 50% dispersed phases. One of the most important factors is the solubility of the surfactant and the different phases forming the emulsion. The general idea is that the interfacial tension will be lower on the side of the interface containing a larger portion of the surfactant where it's more soluble. In this case, the surfactant is shown to be more soluble in water. Because the other side of the interface, the oil side, then has a greater tension, the interface will curl in that direction to produce an oil and water emulsion. Thus, if the surfactant is more soluble in the oil phase, the interface will curl towards the water, producing a water in oil emulsion. This observation that the phase in which the emulsifier is more soluble constitutes the continuous phase is attributed to Wilder, Dwight, Bancroft, and is known as the Bancroft Rule. The rule should be used with great care since it has been shown to have quite a few exceptions. Generating a macroemulsion requires the addition of about 1 to 3% emulsifier based on the amount of the dispersed phase. Emulsifying agents help during the generation of emulsions by reducing the interfacial tension between oil and water. Although polymeric materials and even fine particles are identified as potential emulsifiers, for purposes of breaking a liquid down into small particles, monomeric surfactants are the most effective additive. This is primarily due to their ability to reduce interfacial tension and their size, which allows them to diffuse rapidly to newly formed interface. As discussed in a previous chapter, surfactants reduce the surface tension of water to below about 40 millinewtons per meter. Because of the interactions between the surfactant hydrophobe and oil phase, the addition of surfactant to an oil-water interface can reduce the interfacial tension to levels as low as maybe 0.1 to 10 millinewtons per meter. The impact of this can be seen through the equation for the minimum amount of work required to generate new surface area. In this case, the interfacial tension is that between oil and water. By by lowering this value by more than an order of magnitude, we reduce the minimum work required for creating the new surface area by an equivalent factor, as well as reducing the driving force for particle coalescence.
This example is a twist on the standard minimum work question we have seen before. Here an oil and water are mixed together with and without an emulsifier. Assuming the same amount of work is done to generate interfacial area and assuming a constant density and no coalescence, you are asked to estimate the ratio of average diameters for particles formed with and without the surfactants. Using the minimum work and mass balance equations, it can be shown that the ratio of particle sizes is equal to the inverse of the ratio ratio of interfacial tensions. It is a simple example, but it makes an important point. The presence of surfactants reduces particle sizes by one to two orders of magnitude. To understand how additives stabilize an emulsion once it is generated, it is important to understand how emulsions destabilize. The path of an oil and water emulsion into separated oil and water bulk phases often involves creaming and breaking. It is important to understand that these are large and distinct changes resulting from incremental destabilization interactions between particles which were occurring within the emulsion. Aggregation is one of these. During our discussion on DLVO theory, the general term aggregation described either flocculation or coagulation. Flocks are loosely bound collections of particles. The formation of such structures is associated with the secondary minimum predicted by DLVO theory. Collisions between colloidal particles results from Brownian motion and mixing. However, as the larger flock structures are formed, gravity has an increasing influence on these structures, causing them to either rise or settle in the emulsion depending on particle density. This process results in more collisions and further aggregation. With emulsions, the term coagulation is rarely used. Instead, the irreversible aggregation ultimately results in coalescence in which spherical particles merge to form larger spherical particles. This can occur in the emulsion, resulting in a greater tendency for the dispersed phase to rise or settle, and it can also occur within the collected flocks and particles separated from the colloid. One final mechanism, not described previously, is disproportioning or Oswald ripening. This is the growth of larger particles at the expense of smaller ones due to increased capillary pressure and thus greater solubility of the dispersed phase from the smaller particles. So let's discuss how to slow each of these processes in a little more detail. In the previous chapter, the use of additives to provide electrostatic and or steric stabilization was discussed. For hydrophobic colloids such as oil and water emulsions, charged surfactants and polymers are commonly used to increase the thickness of the electric double layer. This helps inhibit both flocculation and coalescence. However, in the case of water and oil emulsions, the charges carried by such species provide greater solubility in the water phase, but little in the way of protection against aggregation because the charges have little solubility in the oil phase. For such systems, Hydrophobic chains from surfactants, polymers, and even oligomers provide steric stabilization, uh, much in the same way as hydrophilic chains do in an aqueous environment. In some products where increasing viscosity is not an issue, polymeric additives can be used to increase the viscosity of the continuous phase. Particle diffusion is inversely related to viscosity, so the use of polymers to thicken the continuous phase helps stabilize the particles against creaming and sedimentation. It also slows other particle growth mechanisms to increase the overall kinetic stability of an emulsion. Coalescence requires that interfaces be brought together to rupture, eliminating the interface between the particles and allowing particle components to intermix. The rate of this process is largely controlled by the mechanical strength of the interface. Thus, additives that reinforce this region will slow coalescence and the ultimate destabilization of an emulsion. For surfactants, use of a single species, especially if it is charged, provides limited added strength to the interface. Greater lateral interaction is required for reinforcement. This can be provided through the formation of liquid crystalline phases, which occur at high surfactant levels, or from the formation of interfacial complexes. These complexes are thought to form when more oil-soluble surfactant is combined with a more water-soluble species. In addition to reinforcing the interface, this combination is believed to provide for a very low interfacial tension. For polymers, the strengthening of the interface results from their resistance to desorption and the increased viscosity that results from their presence, which increases interfacial resistance to deformation and rupture. Small particles are used to form a rigid barrier at the interface, reinforcing it and inhibiting particle contact. 
The effectiveness of particles at stabilizing emulsion particles is dependent on several factors, including their size, level of colloidal stability, and relative wettability by the phases composing the emulsion. Particles should be small relative to the emulsion particles and relatively unstable. This promotes their movement to the interface and allows for the development of a more continuous structure. It is also beneficial if particles are preferentially wetted by the continuous phase, but not excessively so. An example of this are bentonite clays, which are preferentially wetted by water and are effective at producing uh, oil and water emulsions. Disproportioning, or Oswald ripening, is a process by which larger particles in a system grow at the expense of smaller ones. This results from the fact that the dispersed phase usually possesses a small but still significant solubility in the continuous phase. Furthermore, the chemical potential for the dispersed phase, and thus its dissolution into the continuous phase, is higher from smaller particles due to the higher capillary pressure there, as described by the Kelvin equation. As a result, materials transferred through dissolution from smaller particles to the larger ones. Thus, one approach for eliminating the driving force for disproportioning is to generate emulsions with uniform particle size distributions possessing low poly dispersities. Now, the Kelvin equation is thermodynamic, but disproportioning is a slow process and, and probably better described using kinetic models. The Lipschitz-Slyazov theory predicts that the number average, average particle diameter growth in an emulsion due to Oswald ripening is proportional to properties of the dispersed phase, including its molar volume and solubility and diffusivity in the continuous phase, as well as the interfacial tension between the oil and water phases. It is also inversely related to the square of the average particle size. In other words, the theory indicates that larger and more highly emissible dispersed phases and lower interfacial tensions slow the ripening process, while smaller average particle sizes increase it. One approach often mentioned for limiting Oswald ripening in an oil and water emulsion is the addition of a highly hydrophobic component an ultra-hydrophobe to the oil phase. Studies indicate that this is somewhat effective in countering the dissolution process from smaller particles by creating osmotic pressure as a concentration of the ultra-hydrophobe climbs in the particle phase. Previously, the hydrophilic lipophilic balance, or HLB, of a surfactant was gauged through tests using an oil and a surfactant of known HLBs. Here, surfactants are used to determine the required HLB of an oil. This is the HLB of a surfactant or surfactant mixture that will generate a stable oil and water emulsion for a given oil sample. There is no universally accepted procedure for this testing other than generating emulsions from the oil with surfactants possessing a broad range of HLB values. Initial experiments typically use equal proportions of oil and water and a fixed surfactant concentration in the range of 10 to 20 percent based on the oil weight. The method used to generate the test emulsions should be the same for all samples. Differences may appear immediately, but often samples are allowed to stand for a period of time, for example, 24 hours, prior to a stability assessment. Once the HLB of the oil is determined, Various surfactant mixtures can be tested using the oil's required HLB value as a guide for the mass fractions of the emulsifier components. This should include studies on the influence of concentration. Concentrations of surfactants and final products typically need to be below the tested 10 to 20 percent to produce commercially viable emulsions. It should be emphasized that the technique described is used to identify HLB values for a surfactant or surfactant system that will generate a stable oil in water emulsion. As we expect given the Bancroft rule, the surfactants used for this will be more hydrophilic with HLBs in the range of maybe 8 to 18. Sometimes, with surfactants possessing a broad range of HLBs are used to determine the required HLB for an oil, two stable emulsions are identified one in the expected high HLB range, and another in the HLB range of about three to six. The emulsion in the lower HLB range is likely a water in oil emulsion. In practice, finding the HLB of the surfactants that will produce a water in oil emulsion involves testing surfactant blends with a composite HLB over this three to six range. Another potential finding, especially when initial tests are carried out with high surfactant concentrations, is the solubilization of the oil. When this occurs, there are seemingly multiple stable emulsions in the high HLB range. 
When this does happen, often a stable emulsion can be distinguished by running further studies at decreasing surfactant concentrations. To carry out an emulsion comparison test, surfactants or surfactant blends that cover a broad range of HLB values are required. The surfactants commonly used for this are sorbitan esters and ester ethoxylates. Such surfactants are generated from hexatols, which are six carbon structures with each carbon bound to a hydroxyl group. Hexatols are formed through the reduction of hexoses or monosaccharides. The most common hexatol is sorbitol formed from the reduction of glucose. Under acidic conditions, sorbitol forms five and six member ether-linked ring structures known as sorbitans. Fatty acid esterified sorbitans compose the commercial SPAN surfactant series, for example, SPAN 80, with the number indicating the fatty acid and number used in the esterification. For example, 20 indicates monolaurate, 60 monosterate, 65 tristerate, and 80 monooleate. Ethoxylation of these structures produces sorbitan esterethoxylates, usually containing 20 ethylene oxide linkages. These surfactants are known commonly by the commercial name tween, such as tween 80, with the number again indicating the fatty acids used in the esterification. With this ability to manipulate EO to fatty acid ratios to fine tune the balance between the hydrophilic and hydrophobic character of the surfactants, sorbitan esters and ester ethoxylates make quite versatile emulsifiers, which are currently used extensively in foods, cosmetics, and pharmaceuticals. Surfactant blends covering a broad HLB range are sold in what is called a surfactant kit for carrying out emulsion comparison studies. This package contains a surfactant span 80, span 85, tween 20, and tween 80. The structures along with where they lie on the HLB scale are shown here. These surfactants can be blended together to produce HLB values for the emulsifier that ranges from about 2 up to about 17. So let's formulate some surfactant blends for an emulsion comparison test. As discussed previously, HLB values are additive, and the example asks us to determine the mass fractions of surfactants span 80, span 85, tween 80, and tween 20 required to formulate surfactant blends with HLB values of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16, a broad range of HLB values. Given that the mass fraction of the added surfactants must add up to 1, and that each blend only contains two surfactants. Setting up the equations is straightforward. Here the equations are shown for the blends with HLB values of 2 to 4, 6 to 14, and 16. And the table shows the calculated mass fractions of the different surfactants that are required to reach the desired HLB values. The phase inversion temperature, or PIT, is related to the water solubility of non-ionic surfactants. Non-ionic species used to generate oil and water emulsions are often based on ethylene oxide linkages. The water solubility of these linkages is highly dependent on the ability of water to structure around them. At higher temperatures, the product of absolute temperature and the decrease in the entropy associated with this structuring becomes large enough that the water solubility of the linkages decreases. As a result, the water solubility of many non-ionic surfactant species is inversely related to temperature. According to the Bancroft rule, this decrease in water solubility with increasing temperature means that the surfactant transitions towards a more hydrophobic or more oil-soluble surfactant which is better for stabilizing water and oil emulsions. Thus, there is a temperature, PIT, really a small temperature range, where the surfactant becomes oil-soluble enough that the emulsion phase inverts from an oil-in-water emulsion to a water-in-oil emulsion. This is referred to as the phase inversion temperature, or PIT. Now, the phase inversion temperature can be used as a low energy method for generating emulsions, which involves combining oil, water, and emulsifiers at high temperature, promoting the formation of a water and oil emulsion, and then slowly lowering the temperature to invert the system into an oil in water emulsion. Before briefly reviewing other categories of emulsions, it is worth mentioning a special type of macroemulsion, known as a multiple emulsion. As the name indicates, a multiple emulsion is an emulsion within an emulsion, typically formed in multiple steps, where the particles themselves act as a continuous phase for particles composed of the surrounding continuous phase or a similar liquid miscible in this phase. 
These may be oil and water and oil, or water and oil and water systems, and are inherently quite unstable due to the amount and variety of interface involved. Specifically, two opposite emulsion systems are involved, likely requiring very different surfactants. The nomenclature often employed when describing such systems refers to the emulsion particles as the primary emulsion or emulsion 1, and the dispersion of these particles as the secondary emulsion or emulsion 2. Often the notation O1 slash W slash O2 or W1 slash O slash W2 is used to ensure clarity, which indicates that one is emulsified in water or oil respectively and then emulsified in two. The multiple emulsion is an example of a structured emulsion of which there are many examples. This is currently an active area of research for use in food and drug delivery systems. As with macroemulsions, many emulsions are produced with relatively low emulsifier levels, for example, 1 to 3 percent based on the dispersed phase, and are typically generated using high energy mechanical methods resulting in a particle size distribution that is polydispersed. In fact, many emulsions are considered a subset of macroemulsions in that much of what was discussed above applies to these systems. However, higher energy inputs are required to generate the smaller particles. The smaller particles means that these systems possess more interface and more interfacial energy and thus are more unstable with regard to destabilizing processes such as Oswald ripening and coalescence. Often the designations nanoemulsion and mini emulsion are used interchangeably, but nanoemulsion composes a standalone category. As with macroemulsions, nanoemulsions can be generated with about 1 to 3 percent emulsifier, and these systems are kinetically stable. The emulsifier is typically an ionic surfactant combined with a co-surfactant, or oftentimes just a long chain alcohol which contains more than 12 carbons. This type of emulsion is generated via intense high energy mechanical means. It can also be generated using low energy methods such as PIT and EIP. The particle size distributions tend to be less polydispersed than those for macroemulsions. Major advantages of nanoemulsions include optical clarity and excellent stability due to the small particle size which provides greater resistance against creaming and sedimentation. However, the small particle size increases the rate and influence of Oswald ripening, which is offset somewhat by the lower particle size polydispersity. The differences that exist between macroemulsions and nanoemulsions have to do with their particle size and, to a certain extent, the dominant mechanisms involved in their destabilization. Microemulsions are distinctly different. Their generation requires surfactant contents as high as 12 to 20 percent based on the dispersed phase. Such systems form spontaneously, requiring just simple mixing as opposed to high shear, and they are thermodynamically stable. These systems are complex, still poorly understood, and are the topic of entire textbooks. Books. An apparent ultra-low surface tension near zero is often cited as a distinguishing feature of such systems. Microemulsions are probably better thought of as swollen micelles as opposed to traditional emulsions. Selection of a surfactant or surfactant blend is key in the formation of such systems. It is found that surfactants better able to take in oil work best. These are thought to be surfactants with critical packing parameters or CPPs near unity, which is viewed as a rough gauge of the relative interaction of surfactants in the aqueous phase to that in the oil phase. When considering the use of this concept in surfactant selection, it is important to keep in mind that CPP is not only dependent on surfactant structure, it is also determined by system conditions, for example, ionic strength and temperature. This completes our introduction to emulsions. We next move on to foams where we will see some of the same general concepts reappear, but these systems are different enough in their structures and in their stabilization mechanisms that several new concepts will be discussed.